hear me? Can you hear? Yes. 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 Great. <laughs> okay. Um, we've had we been sort of gradually moving out of London um, in our talks with fantastic talk on the rose and the archaeology of the Colne Valley. I want to have a look at what was happening on, as I do in my research, around the frontiers of Imperial Rome at forts and fortresses, and in particular the households of um, the officers of auxiliary units. And when I say households, I mean households, I mean the enslaved men and women, the wives, the children, as well as, as the uh, nuclear family uh, members. Um, right, so where were they? So we have the people I'm talking about lived in places as far flung as Volubilis in Morocco, up at Hadrian's Wall, and along the German Lamers. The, the key point and the kind of connecting factor to them all was that they were all on the frontiers. Um, now, just as we have great archaeology coming up on the foreshore, the archaeological finds have the potential to be very disruptive to what we think we know about them. Um, these people have been of interest um, to antiquarians, to politicians, to archaeologists, to literary researchers for a few hundred years. Um, and in fact, this is um, picture here is by Rembrandt of the Conspiracy of Batavians by Claudius Cuvinis, 17th century. Um, now, what happened, um, or what we think we ha happened from all of our literary sources, and there's, there's good evidence for this, is that actually um, when Rome went and conquered or had or made allies, um, they recruited men into these units. Um, the soldiers were not Roman citizens, but their officers were. So they've got this sort of identity of being both being Romans and not Romans. Uh, they were also equestrians, which puts the, the commanders, which puts them right at the top of uh, Roman society, only a little bit under the senators. There's a sort of peculiar status. Um, they don't feature much in the literary uh, stories by elite Romans, though, tended to be written by Rome. And when they are named, as Civilis was in both Tacitus's history and his Germania, um, it's sort of embellished and it tends to focus on the, the sort of non romanness of these men. Um, so, you know, they turn up like here in, in revolts and rebellions, um, and that's so that they're a bit. A bit questionable. Um, this is, uh, has given sort of rise to lots of lots of interest. Um, it, for example, in Dutch history, the, the Batavian unit um, who came from around the Batavians were lived around the Rhine. Um, they were recruited in this manner, and uh, Tacitus writes about them. So, um, sort of Netherlands history. This became very interesting. The works of Tacitus became known again and available in the next within the 15th century so you have people like Erasmus taking on these uh, taking on the, the writings and, and reinterpreting them and using them if you're interested in this there's a very um, good website on UCL about the history and about how these these were mythologized and the significance of them to Dutch history now another of the men who features in Tacitus is Julius Indus who was a Treveran um, and also, of course, a Roman citizen who commanded a cavalry wing in Gaul, named after himself, the Alla Indiana. And we do have some archaeology here, because his daughter, Julia Picata, put up a funerary monument here in London. Now, she married the procurator uh, for Britain, Gaius Iulius Alpinus Classicianus, and commissioned this rather grand monument to him, which was found in two pieces in the medieval city wall at Trinity Square, a little bit north of Tower Hill, um, and the original is now in the British Museum. Uh, this is a copy. Um, the stone had been reused, so we don't know what structure it was originally from. And I said, this is a copy, and it's a bit difficult to see how much of the inscription was actually missing. Um, but enough of the names remains that we can be pretty sure that she was his daughter because of the way her name is, um, and also because we know that this met the dates between her father and when Classic Giannis was procurator. As you can see, the monument is huge, the letter carving is of good quality, so Julia looks like she's a woman who's had quite a lot of money and she was trying, she was intending to make an impact. And if you actually notice, she, the lettering of her own name is about the same size as that of her husband. She's making her mark. Um, 
that's about all we can say of her. Uh, the, her husband might have had a son who was involved in the Batavian Revolt. There was a Treveran commander named Tacitus as Alpinus Montanus. We don't know who his mother was. We don't know who Julia's mother was, where she was born, how she came to be in London. And that's, that's as far as we can take her story. I think as frogs, we're fairly used to having more questions than our evidence can answer. Um, we've got lots of missing timbers and things that we'd like to find in the archives but aren't there. And so this kind of comes up all the time in my research because um, what I'm actually looking for is in material rains for people who it's difficult to trace, they either didn't write, their writers didn't survive very well, or they've not left much um, in the way of material evidence. I mean, even if you look at Julia Picata, she's, she's not really a typical wife. She married the procurator of Britain, you know, he's the chief financial officer for the, country, for the province. Um, her dad's name is Tacitus. Actually, we don't know very much about most individual officers. Inscriptions survive, naming about 2,100 of the men, which, if you think about how many units there probably were, we know more about this because, of course, we get soldiers' inscriptions and we have, so that they're often numbered as well as names named. We know about 47% of all of the men. The picture when you come to other household members is much worse. I looked through um, for inscriptions relating to 450 of these household uh, members, and from these I can only find about 50 households who had members who were a part of the household at the time the commander held command. Many of the others may have been, but they were either come from a town context or um, we don't know what, what date they were and, and quite what was going on at the time. They also don't even name household members individually sometimes such as this altar from Vindolanda, which as you can see is dedicated to Proce Axuis, which means he's, the commander's doing this for himself and for his family, for his household particularly. That should, I mean the translation there is the translation that's given, but it actually it's, it's better translated as his household. So what does this mean? Does this mean that the households are not usually at forts and fortresses? Or is it just that they're not there in the inscriptions? I think it's largely the latter, not least because there are almost no inscriptions naming officers slaves, and we do know that the slaves were there. They're mentioned by several authors, and they're sometimes depicted in sort of decoration on, officers, on soldiers' tombstones. And it's kind of weird not to have inscriptions for slaves, given that in places like Rome we have a lot. The absence of these inscriptions, though, is probably why an idea um, came about frontier forts and fortresses were a sort of boys only zone with some camp followers outside the gates. And there's actually a whole fascinating history of archaeologists who I don't have time to discuss that the, in the early 20th century they excavated many of the forts in Germany and along Hadrian's Wall and they were themselves military men and this has coloured how they perceived the Roman army and strongly influenced later views of forts and fortresses. We do know that there was a marriage ban on um, early in the empire on soldiers on active service, but quite how this related to sort of realities on the ground um, and also later views that there were no officers' wives or even female slaves within fort walls. It's very difficult to say that from uh, the quite weak literary evidence. <coughs> However, more recently, new archaeological evidence has been found and the picture now seems much more complex. We've got good evidence for the existence of women and children, at least from some forts. Um, for example, these. You can argue about who used a sewing needle or who wore beads, but large numbers of leather shoes have been found within barracks and the Praetoria, the houses at forts where the commanding officers and their families lived. And you can see you get children's shoes from sort of toddler size upwards, and this is um, a fine lady's shoe that was found at Vindolanda. Most of these come from Vindolanda, um, where the anaerobic conditions are very good, not unlike those in the foreshore, where you also find good leather preservation. Um, but you also have similar finds from the second century forts at the Saalberg in Germany and Zwamadan in the Netherlands. And rather sadly, you also find articulated skeletons of young babies from under barrack floors, for example, at South Shields. Then, and my final piece of evidence, which is, I think, my favourite, um, are the now famous writing tablets from Vindolanda, including this invitation from Claudia Severa to Sulpicia Lepidila, two commanders' wives at different forts, 
in which Claudia is asking Sulpicia to come, sorry, Lepidino is asking Sulpicia to come to her birthday party. This is written in two different hands, one of which will be that of the scribe, where the other is Sulpicia's own. And you can see this here. This is the sign up where she writes, I shall expect you, sister. Farewell, sister, my dear soul, as I hope to prosper and hail. Or some Latin that more or less says that. Um, and that's, so we've got, as far as we can tell, this is the oldest handwriting um, in Latin by a woman. And there may be some of the ostraca and that because it's very difficult to date exactly and precisely many of these um, types of evidence. So Picky features in 10 tablets, um, either as we mentioned or that she writes, um, and two in particular give some idea of relationships within the fort and within perhaps the fort community around the fort. One is a request made by someone called Balata, whose name is unusual, but she is probably female, asking the command to do something uh, for the sake of Sulpicia, and we don't know what because it's unclear. And the second is a note from a woman called Paterna saying that she will bring to Sulpicia two remedies and recipes, uh, again, not clear, and one is probably for a fever. So, what have I found so far um, in my research looking at this rather disparate source material? Wish there were more inscriptions for household members that come from ports and fortresses. It's tricky to explain why there isn't. About half of our evidence for the women is funerary, and we think that officers had typically one three-year posting. So if the officers survived the postings, they were likely to, and their wife did, or their wife is likely to. Um, and if the women received commemorations, which they didn't always, I would expect to find that those commemorations were in towns where you can't actually tell whether or not um, their wives went with them the thought or whether they were married to somebody else while they were there which is another, possi uh, another possibility. So I think looking at who commemorates commanders at the frontier may be my next step in this answering this question. The other half of the inscriptions which aren't, well it's also more usual for a husband as a commander to put up inscriptions due to the nature of his job. So we know a lot more about the commanders themselves although as I've said still not a lot and others in the household. The evidence that we do have from Vindolanda, um, and also we have um, similar uh, but less um, evidence from places like um, Vindish, um, uh, which is uh, the Nidrin Fortress there, suggests that letter writing was used routinely by wives and people close to these households, including women. The letters discuss arrangements for travel, health, visits, entertainment, and children in a quite a sophisticated way and are a rich source of information about how these households operated, which will be my next piece of research. And it also reminds us that um, new archaeological discoveries will and should continue to challenge our views about these households. And we also need to keep thinking about how the views we have, how we've acquired them, how they've been shaped, and whether they're right. Thank you.